Every single day you are consumed with information. With the 24-7 negative news cycle and a pop culture that's polluting the airways, all selling out for the ratings game. Well, guess what? There's a more positive way to look at life. You live in the greatest city in the greatest country on the planet. Every day with our elite network of professionals, our goal is to educate, empower, and engage. And now it's time to fight for your American dream. All right, welcome to the show. Now joining me in studio, this guy came from the real estate business, successful there. He has one heck of a story that has now led him to writing books and being a consultant for other entrepreneurs and business professionals. Steve Rogers joins us in studio. Good to have you on hey, here, Hey, Craig, good to be here as always. Thank you. Yeah, so for, is this the first time we had you on the show? I know uh, you've been on the Silver Hair Tsunami. I've been in your studio many times, but I think yeah. this is the first time I've sat at your desk, actually. Well, you know, it's a process to get in here. <laughs> no, but you... I'm finally uh, at the big table. Like on Thanksgiving with the kids, you're finally at the big it's, table. You know? It's exciting, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. So, you know, it's good to have you in here. You know, I've known you for many years. Uh, you had a very successful run in the real estate business. You still have uh, some things you do there. But now you've advanced to doing some other things, which are much more business coaching. You've written your book, which we'll get to here in a moment. Yeah, sure. I'd love for you to share your story. It's a good one. Oh, thanks. Well, yeah, I've been in the real estate business for 25 years. Started in sales, went from sales to management, and landed in a company called Prudential California Realty in 1994, which many people might have heard of. Uh, It was one of the largest in, in the United States. But when I joined that company, we had around probably 10 or 12 offices And it was owned by a guy named Steve Games and a lady named Nida. And they were just really phenomenal entrepreneurs and still are. Um, But we grew that company over a 10, 15 year, 10 year period to 105 offices, around 5,000 salespeople. We were doing around $25 billion a year in sales volume. We were doing around 38,000 transactions a year. So it was a great run. So I went from being in a small company to help being part of that. So I grew from being a manager and then I eventually became the CEO of that company. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I rose through the food chain, as they say, and I became the CEO. And then we got bought by Warren Buffett in 2001. So I worked under the Warren Buffett home service companies for about seven years uh, and was in that whole process of learning to go from entrepreneur to corporate America, to Sarbanes-Oxley and regulated stuff. And uh, meeting Warren Buffett was definitely a highlight of my career. So that was a great corporate run until it wasn't. Mm-hmm. And then the wasn't is part of what, what the book's about as well. So, The book is From Lead to Gold. Yeah, From Lead so, to Gold. So now let's explain. So that's you know, your, your path through real estate. But now your passion is more in coaching others, lifting other people up. You have a pretty empowering story of your own. So explain kind of where your passion is now. Yeah, well, thank you for that. Well, I went from corporate America actually in a forced transition. I'd been at that company for 15 years. You probably remember the real estate market in 2008. Yeah, (laughs) it was doing really well. It was like, boom, brick upside the head. So as much as I was involved in helping grow that company and and uh, help it grow with a huge team, of course, but um, we ended up consolidating and closing. Mm -hmm. So we closed like half of our company in a year and a half. And then I got downsized and pushed out. So after so 15 years, struggles. yeah, so I got fired. And then I started my own company. I started my own real estate company and ran that for five years. Um, but then I decided that I was not as passionate as I wanted to be about real estate in the way it used to run. Mm-hmm. And I was having some challenges with my franchisor and business struggles internally. And I thought I can either keep hitting myself up against the wall or I can take a whole different path. So I decided to break away from the real estate industry as I'd been in it and started a consulting company. It's called Alchemy Advisors. And it came with the premise of a couple reasons. I love the book The Alchemist by mm-hmm. Paulo Coelho. Uh, and it's just a great parable of life story. I love the word alchemy, which represents transition and transformation. And in the story, it talks about the alchemist who used to turn lead into gold, taking yep. something of value and turning it into even more value, which is gold. So the book is about transformation. It's about transition. So that is your book, From Lead to Gold. From Lead to Gold, So you exactly. just wrote this. Uh, I've seen some of the social media posts. Looks like it's off to a good run. Yeah, thank you. We had number one Amazon bestseller status, and that was fun. And we continue to sell great books uh, and great progress on that. And what the goal was that was to help other people that might be transitioning in any areas of their life, whether it's from corporate America to become an entrepreneur, whether it's going from something there one relationship to another, whether it's health challenges. You know, we all have struggles in our life. We all have challenges. We all have transitions, and they're either forced or chosen. And it's just never going to not be that way. So how do you embrace that and make that your friend? And I talk in the book about processes and steps about embracing change and turning your life into what you really want it to be. What's a good way to embrace change? uh, The best way is to realize, number one, what you want your life to be. You know, Mm -hmm. we have our life of what it is. And then we have this dream about where we want it to be. And there's this gap in the middle. And the gap is where there's stress. 
The gap is where there's discomfort. And the gap is where I call the hole in the soul. You yeah. know, we all have this hole in the soul that we don't quite feel as fulfilled as we want to be. So the goal is to then map out a life plan and a business plan that starts helping you get there. Not just a business plan, but a life plan. I'm talking about spirituality, fitness, relationships, and designing your entire life that you want, and then having someone help you get to that, that point. So what would be, so I mean, just listed off a few things. When you say that there's a gap, there's a variety of ways that you can have a gap. You could love your job, but maybe having challenges in your relationship, or maybe love your relationship, but you're having challenges spiritually. Or, right, sure. Or with your health. Right. So you take a holistic approach to all of this. Very much so. And I have something that I do for myself, which is a daily scorecard, and it's my life scorecard. And I score four areas of my life on a daily basis, and I get one point for each one. I have body, being, bonds, and business. And my body is to make sure I'm on my vegan eating plan that I'm on a daily basis. I've He's been a for a year and a half. Huh? For a year and a half, I would have never thought it. How is it? And it's excellent. My energy's through the roof, my clarity, my thought. I, I would have never expected it would, is what it is, but it's mm -hmm. phenomenal. So I have to get a half a point for eating vegan and a half a point for working out my body every day. So that's okay. one point. Then for my bonds, I have to work on relationships within my family and my immediate family, and I have to do something outside of my family in the world. So I get half a point, half a point, one point. My business, I have to work on my business and in my business. I get a point for that. And then, uh, so there's body, beings, bonds, and business. And then I get another half a point in, uh, so my relationships, my body, my business, and my spirituality, where I have to meditate daily and do something of spiritual practice, and then I have to do something of spiritual action in the world. And I'm just trying to get to four points a day. And if I do that, then I'm getting to 28 points in a week. I have the scorecard that I use to see if I'm on track. And it keeps me focused every day on my goals of what I'm trying to do in those areas of my life. The last one, meditation. How important is that one? To me, that's crucial. My, my most important thing is, is outside of myself. My higher power and my higher purpose in my life is the energy and the fuel in which I tap into the rest of the things that I do. So to me, meditation is like going to Starbucks and tapping into Wi-Fi. You know, I don't know how Wi-Fi works, but it works. Right. Uh, and I know I've got a signal stronger than if I had no Wi-Fi. So for me, meditation is my link to tapping into source to get more energy, more clarity, more thought, and really keeps me balanced and centered in my life. So everything that you're doing, the coaching that you're doing, the book, it's about a holistic approach just to getting the most out of your life, even measuring it with things as simple as a scorecard with a one-point score yeah. on a daily basis. Steve Rogers from Lead to Gold. I hope you can pick this up. I'm sure people can go online, check Amazon, out your... Amazon, absolutely. And the Audible book comes out this uh, next month, so they can get it on Amazon. And the book, basically, if you're looking to increase anything in productivity, profit, or purpose... And purpose is my big motivator, but everyone wants productivity and profit. Uh, but if you don't have purpose, then all the rest of that's kind of meaningless. Awesome. Steve Rogers, thanks for coming on the show. Hey, Appreciate, great, thanks. The, Appreciate um, it. the moving story. All right, now joining us in studio, he is the author of Fight Quotes. He is the founder of Epic Fighting, and you've seen him on this show plenty of times by now. we got Jason Stewart joining us in the studio. What's up, man? Glad to be here. Like and always. always with a great guest, JT Steele. So JT, let me get this right. You're the president of Camo, which that, is basically, as you described it during the break, the NCAA for, what'd you say? For mixed, mixed martial for arts. For mixed martial that's, arts, that's right? Correct. So yeah. you are the regulatory body. You're the president. That's right. Interesting. So MMA is just a fascinating sport as a whole. I'm a huge fan of it. Great fights last weekend, by the way. Uh, but it's, it, it's had some controversy. I'm sure it hasn't been easy for you to, to build uh, epic fighting from the ground up. So let's talk about the emergence of the actual sport from your point of view, Jason. Yeah, well, when I started Epic Fighting, I was one of the first uh, people to join Camo, which was a brand new organization that, that JT and his partner put together. And thank goodness they did because there was no place for fighters to get a start. Yeah. It was like, there's no way to just jump into the UFC, but where do you get these build-up fights? And it was really... You know, the, it was almost illegal as a sport, especially on the amateur level. Right. You had to go to these, like, you know, kind of dirty, unregulated places where there was Turn no insurance mm -hmm. and try to get some fights and hope that that would have some clout. Uh, and it was the only sport where you had to start pro. You know, boxers will do 50, 100 amateur matches growing up before they ever do, you know, a pro boxing match. Uh, any other sport, you know, tennis, you go amateur and you tear it up in the amateurs become the best and then you go pro and then you know it's like you're starting from scratch again but you have all that experience and thanks to JT um, that's that's available now so help us better understand what your role from the inception I mean I understand this was a, a thesis you had about MMA and then to be the president of camo explain your, your storyline here well you know I actually had a, a family member who was an aspiring professional fighter okay and he got his start fighting in you know in small clubs, in the back of warehouses, in very unsafe conditions. Not a good place. Horrible fight, condition, right? right? 
But this at the time was the pathway to become a professional fighter. I was in law school at the time, and I wrote a, a, my note, essentially a thesis paper, uh, on the legalization of amateur MMA. Uh, and now at this time, did you have the pro level kind of established? Pro level was was because what, the, the, what I'm taking from this already is that you have the pro level, the the UFC, but there wasn't the underlying training ground to get to that pro level. Right. So what your thesis exactly. is arguing is that there needs to be that underlying. <clears throat> opportunity to grow the right way, not in the back alley behind a bar. Exactly. A, path, okay. a pathway to the pros. Right. But, you know, and it wasn't just not organized. In the state of California, it was actually unregulated and illegal. Right. So there was no option for them. So write this note and actually kind of convince myself through the process that this needs to be done. We formed a, a tremendous nonprofit organization with a really impressive uh, board of advisors with including Boss Rutten, Dan Henderson, you know, some of these classic yeah. names, Eric Paulson. Dan Henderson still, at what, 40 Hero. years old? The man's still man. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't he incredible? Yeah. Right? yeah. And he's right here in San Diego. I see the guy all the time around here. Yeah, yeah he is definitely a local guy. So we, we, uh, we lobbied the state for over a year, and finally were delegated the authority to organize and to regulate amateur MMA uh, to create a, an organization and a structure that's respectable and gives uh, direction to these athletes and a pathway for them to pursue their dreams. So we created it, uh, and one of the first promoters actually in the state who saw the vision of what would become a tr you know, one of the fastest growing sports in the world was Jason Stewart with Epic Fighting. So we've been, doing, we've been working together with Jason Stewart in San Diego for six, almost seven years now. So tell the audience your role within the sport, Jason, right? So you are identifying these fights. You're bringing people from all over the world to fight. What, what is the pathway, in your, from your point of view, of the fighter? The pathway of the fighter? Yeah. Uh, well, How do you become the, the world heavyweight champ in UFC yeah. uh, from your perspective? It, it, it's tough because it's, it's the chicken or the egg. Do you try to become a great fighter and start making income doing that to quit your day job? Or do you quit your day job, burn all the bridges, and just go 100%, and then you're just you know living broke and, and on someone's couch for the next few years until that happens? And aren't a lot of these guys doing both, right? They're maintaining a job throughout the day. And yeah, a lot of them have college degrees. A lot of them are running their own business, or they have great jobs, and they're still doing it. So there's two types of fighters. There's a type of fighter that does it for the passion. You know, those are the types of fighters who, you know, they would do it for free. They would travel around and pay money. A lot of them have paid money to do these pancreation and these jujitsu tournaments and different wow. types of things to compete because it's in them. That's what they want to do. They love it. It's the adrenaline rush. It's the passion for the sport. And then there's the people that are like, you know what? I think I could be good at this. This is something that I could actually make money doing. Some mm -hmm. of them hate the training, but they know, like, if I don't do this, I don't know where I might, I might be a janitor. You know, this is where their talents are, so they have to make it. Interesting. And like a, so, like a, a, who recently passed, unfortunately, but um, I'm drawing a blank on his name. Kimbo Slice. K Kimbo Slice. Mm -hmm. I had right. the opportunity to work many years with Kimbo. Yeah, yeah, you did work now, with Kimbo. Now, he was a street fighter, he, right? He, he yeah. was. His, his was story is fascinating. pretty talented. Yeah, he was good at it, and then that's his, uh, he found a way to make money with it. And so there's two types of fighters. The one that wants to become the UFC champion, and they want that to be their career, and the ones that are just passionate about it. And, and you got to admire both. You know, Both of them are doing something that 90-something percent of the population could only imagine, and they look at those types of people and admire. I was just telling JT, I met all of these you know, super successful people, even a billionaire, and they read my book, Fight Quotes, and they were just so mesmerized by these fighters. Not only their, you know, their, their quotes about fighting, but their quotes about life. And you know, no matter what you've done or how successful you are, you, know, you look at someone who's actually had the guts to get inside of that cage and do what these fighters do, you admire that. You know? Well, just their work ethic. The, the, the amount of work that they have put to get gym ready or yeah. fight ready, I guess is a better expression. And the bravery to do it. Because there's a lot oh, of people that have the skill, me? the talent, uh, the conditioning. They're in shape to do it, but they'll never do it. They'll never get in there and actually yeah. do it. Yeah, and, and how can you blame them? I mean, it's, a, it's an incredible sport. But what I love about it is through guys like you, the regulation of the sport has protected a lot of lives. You, you see more deaths in other sports than you do in MMA. So Give the way some examples of some stuff that you've heard on non-regulated shows. I've heard a but ton. But you know, it's the importance of like a regulated fight. Yeah. If you look at the injuries, the serious injuries and deaths that have occurred in mixed martial arts over the years, 
uh, the majority of them are in unregulated competitions where they don't do blood testing, where they don't have doctors and right. uh, physicians working the event. And So these fights are going to happen with or without you. What you've done is you've created a regulatory body that says, look, if these things are going to be happening, let's create a, the real pathway that's Screening, safer, more protected, and allows these competitive athletes to not be in the back warehouse, but actually be in a, a real forum yeah. Uh, certainly partnering real with doctors. people like Epic Fighting, real doctors, and, yeah. and ultimately have that pathway or ultimately determine it's, it's not for them. But let's get it, let's get it cleaned up. Absolutely. I yes. had a guy, uh, excuse me, I had a guy who called me and said, hey, do you guys test for hepatitis? I was like, absolutely. He's like, oh, okay, well, I'm going to go fight on this other show on the reservation that doesn't because I tested positive, but there's no way I'm not fighting. And that blew my mind that that was yeah. this guy's mentality, you know? Best quote in the book? Come Best on. quote in the book. Give uh, us a good Bruce, one. Bruce Lee, I fear not the man who has practiced 10,000 kicks once. I fear the man who has practiced one kick 10,000 times. That's a great quote. It's pretty good. <laughs> All right, on that note, thanks, guys, for coming on the show. Learned a little bit today from you, JT. Hope we can have you on again. Good luck. What's your next fight? October 28th, Four Point Sheraton Resort. Tickets are at epicfighting.com. Cool. All right, man, appreciate you guys coming on the show. Hey, guys, today we're coming to you from Mission Hills. This is an upscale neighborhood located just north of downtown San Diego and overlooks Old Town, Downtown, and the San Diego Bay. Home to two historic districts, Mission Hills is primarily a residential area, but it does have some incredible boutique stores and restaurants nestled within the community. We're at this gorgeous home listed with Real Estate Elite and the only real estate agent to be named by the San Diego Padres as their official realtor, Melissa Tucci. Let's go catch up with her now. Melissa, thanks for having us. Thanks for being here. So we are in Mission Hills. Tell us a little bit about this area. So Mission Hills is the best of all worlds. It's one of the oldest and more, most preserved cities in the um, city of San Diego. You're just right outside of downtown. You're near Old Town. You're near Normal Heights, North Park. It's an amazing area, walking distance, um, a mile from everything. You could see this beautiful view. You're looking at the Coronado Bridge, downtown, the bay. Um, really one of the well, one of my favorite places in San Diego. What is real estate like in this area? Real estate um, is very limited. There's not as much inventory. Um, a lot of people who own in Mission Hills have been here for years, sometimes 50 years. Sometimes properties remain in the family for a long time. This particular property that we're at as well has been um, owned by the same owners for over 20 years. And so it's just, usually when properties come on the market, they don't last very long just because it's such a desirable location. Does that make a home more desirable when it's had an owner for decades? It does actually, because it has a feeling where it's more taken care of, more well-maintained. There's not a lot of turnover in the area, creating more desirability to be there. So it really makes a big difference. Absolutely, a sense of community. Ap yes, absolutely, a sense of community and a place where everyone wants to be. So that's why when things come on the market, it's a very you know desirable area that people want to look at right away. Let's talk a little bit about San Diego as a whole, the marketplace. We're halfway through the summer. I know that summer tends, spring and summer tend to be the height of the market. What, what trends do you see going on? You know, it's interesting because I still see in some properties and price points um, multiple offer situations. And then on other properties, um, a little bit longer market time. A lot of people sometimes are out of town for the summer um, or some people just have other activities, you know, and events that they're doing and kind of putting things on hold. So I think overall we're still in a really stable market and it's it, very low interest rates, a lot of buyers still looking. So I still feel really strong about the current marketplace. Is that really what propels the pricing is the interest rates? Uh, yes and no. Just the fact that they're so low really just creates a more affordability level. Plus rents, as you know, do not go down, especially in San Diego. And so it's really amazing how much the rents have increased. While if the interest rates are lower, it really helps justify why you should own instead of renting. So even though prices might be high right now, we're kind of back to maybe where we were close to a decade ago, it might even be less expensive to own than rent? Absolutely, depending on the location and the price point. Right, and then you're paying for your future. Exactly, and it's your property. It's your property. Mm -hmm. So we're in Mission Hills, gorgeous Mission Hills. Tell us a little bit about what's going on in the area. I know there's a lot of social events 
events coming on up, up here? Absolutely. In Pioneer Park, which is off of Washington and Mission Hills, they have summer concerts there, which is a great and fun event for all ages. Um, also coming up in, in the near future is the annual home tour where you could actually tour architecturally designed craftsman bungalows in Mission Hills. So it's a really neat way to get to know the community even better. That's so great. I love that so much. And speaking of architecture, here we are at one of your listings and a famous architect built this property. Yes, ab absolutely. His name is Norm Applebaum and he's a renowned architect in San Diego known for timeless contemporary designs, classic designs. Um, this property is located on Bandini. We're up on the hill. You have fantastic views. It's a four bedroom, two and a half bathroom, almost 2,800 square feet. Um, three different decks to enjoy this beautiful view. Master suite, chef's kitchen that was actually in Sunset Magazine in the wow. past. Um, you know, it has solar, so you're energy efficient here as well. So, so many fantastic things about the property and the location and the view. It's just a phenomenal, you know, package for, for a potential buyer. Absolutely, you can't beat it. And the price? The price it's listed at 1.79 million. 1.79 million. And so for the area, we're priced right, right on target. We're also on a canyon lot over an acre. So you have such privacy. Um, it's really a unique find. And nobody knows this area better than you because you're right up the street from here. Yeah, my office isn't too far away. And so, that, like I said, this is one of my favorite areas in all of San Diego. I know that you're the official real estate agent for the San Diego Padres. That must come with some perks. Here we are. We have the all-star game coming up. Can you go? Absolutely. And in fact, there's even like the legacy and the celebrity game on Sunday that I'll be attending. There's a huge gala on Monday at the Broadway Pier. There's so many fun events. It brings in so many tour, you know, tourism. It brings in so many people. It's and you know, what better place to have an all-star game in San Diego? Oh, absolutely. And, and there's really nothing that you don't do and that you can't do because you're also featured on Top Agent Magazine. Yes, I'm actually going to be on that next month. It's a magazine um, throughout the nation where they you get nominated and then they ask for top agents um, and they feature you and do a cover story. So that's going to be on um, next month, which is really exciting. I'm also involved in a new book that is being written um, by a real estate author. Um, and I'm writing a chapter regarding my experiences in San Diego. And so it's just a lot of different things um, coming together, really um, exciting. And um, it's, you know, I'm really enjoying it. Thank you so much, Melissa. Yeah, thanks for coming. You just heard from real estate elite Melissa Tucci about all the fantastic things she's got going on, everything that's happening in Mission Hills right now, and this beautiful property that she's got for sale. Back to the show. Now, joining us in studio, Aran Sinai. He is the number one credit expert, as far as I'm concerned, on the planet. Uh, it's something I've learned so much about over the years, not just from credit scoring and reports, but now we're in this world of identity theft. So, Aran, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. So help me be a consumer advocate. That's what I try and be on this show, right? Uh, this morning, have you ever heard of the skim? It's a yes. newsletter. It's mm -hmm. like a, a political, neutral kind of fun newsletter that goes out to God knows how many people. And I'm reading it this morning, and apparently uh, the U.S. just found that China has breached some sort of records of the FDIC mm -hmm. and been monitoring and stealing information for years. This, yeah. is, a, this is a macro problem, mm -hmm. and down to the individual, a micro problem. For everybody watching shows right now, you're getting your identity stolen by professionals at it. Start macro. Start worldly and cybercrime. Okay, so talking about cybercrime, do you know that now the assumption is that, you know, you remember the Sony hack, right? Right. They were blaming North Korea. Yeah. Now they're saying that actually someone else hacked in through the North Korean system into Sony. So they're saying it's, you're talking about, when you're talking about macro, right, level. Yeah. So it's not North Korea. It's someone who hacked into North Korea to hack into China. So they use North Korean systems to get into Sony. Wow. So when you're talking about macro and global. That's a serious threat. It I is. mean, when you're, when you're in is. a war on terror and, mm -hmm. and the way the communication and technology, I mean, a lot of the ways that terrorists communicate is through social media, which it's just, it, it, it's, it's mind blowing to it, me. It is that an energy. Think about energy resources, think about what we store. Think about here, our city of San Diego. Right. Do you know that I was talking the other day to Gary Hayslip, who is the CISO, the Chief Information Security Officer for the city of San Diego. He told me that when he gets in the morning to the office, he gets what's called a Palo Alto report that tells him how many 
uh, hacking attempts were to the city of San Diego site. Every night there are about 60,000 attempts for people to hack into our storage, our data here in the city of San Diego. <laughs> and if you're not terrified yet, <laughs> what else, Iran? <laughs> so let me tell you another interesting thing on a micro level, okay? So there was a research a few weeks ago that was done. There was a team of experts, about 500 of them went out in the market. Now they figured out, so they figured out that there are hackers out there with algorithm systems. They can look, when you type on your password on your phones or your devices, sure. by your hand movements, on the first attempt, 80% of them were able to figure out your password, and after five attempts, 99 of the five tries were able to get your password as you're entering into your cell phone. Huh. So if that doesn't scare you yet, so. Is there more? <laughs> so, so really, all right, so, let, yeah. so again, now we gotta get to me uh, as a consumer advocate wanting to give advice to the people that are tuning exactly. in. We gotta protect you. Identity theft is rampant. It can destroy your credit. It can steal your money. It's happened to me. Thank goodness I know Iran because he helped me fix it like that. What is some advice you can give to people today? All right, in? so when you sit in public and you sit in with your cell phone, first of all, when you sit in Starbucks, how many of you sit there and order products, right? You show up online, you call in, and then you call in. When you give your credit card number and your three-digit code in the back, look around you, make sure nobody's watching you or listening or jotting down your number. You'll be amazed how many people still sit in public and do their ordering, do their banking, and speak out loud. Two, when you enter your password, I know it sounds crazy, but the hackers know exactly when you press enter and you stop, they know that that's when you stop. So they figure out the algorithm where your password is. So my suggestion is it sounds, re it sounds really childish, but fake it. In other words, when you start entering your pers password, pretend you're starting a few digits before and continue now, pretending after. Now, is this, is this after. if people are happen to be watching, or are you talking about they have ways that they can read into your no, phone? No, they're sitting there. People are sitting, could be sitting, and reading hand movements of people. Wow. Now, what about... Uh, stuff online. We're all shopping online these days. We do our holiday shopping. It's easier. Mm -hmm. I, I buy furniture online. Well, so clear your cash. You more clear your cash and cookies in your computers. Um, when you when you order online, see where you're ordering. If you're sitting in a public place and ordering, and your computer is out there opening, and everyone's sitting next to you, be a little bit more discreet about your orders. When you use Wi-Fi, you know we all sit in the airport and show up online until the flight gets there. Try to not use public Wi-Fi's. Try to use secure ones. It's mm. really important. What if you've been a victim of identity theft? Well, the first thing you need to do is, obviously, ID Cyber Center. Go on the website, idcybercenter.com. You'll call our toll-free 24-7 number. We can help you. idcybercenter.com. Yep. If you have been through identity mm -hmm. theft, what, and if you're trying to protect from it, I know if, you guys have some policies. Yeah, there so we have, uh, exactly, we have three programs that are designed, they're very affordable, very robust programs that protect you, help you be protected from anything out there, including social media, the dark web world, your credit, everything at idcybercenter.com. idcybercenter.com. Visit that website. I'm doing it Absolutely. as soon as we get out of the show here today. It's just smart, you can protect yourself. If these things were to happen, it's an insurance. Yes. And, and it's funny, you just mentioned social media. I mean, you can get your reputation tarnished as well. Yep. And I know some of this stuff probably sounds crazy to you, but well, in the last two years, we had a check written out of my account, my credit card compromised, and someone hacked into my Facebook account putting up a political post about me, which really tarnished my reputation, and we had to get that out of there. Uh, it's, it's a big deal, idcybercenter.com. Thank you, Ron. That's all for today. As you know, my goal with every show is to educate, empower, and engage with your American dream. We're out today. Have a good one.